because I loved Lucy as a character and I thought there was no chance. Really a feast or famine time. Uh, the entire time I thought it was only a matter of time before I got fired. Multiple times that I'll come home at the end of the day and I have to like decompress. Barney is actually what inspired me to want to be an, an actor when I was a child. But then when I see the final product and I see who got cast and I see the entire... Now, coverage like no other. Bringing you videos from the event floor. You're watching convention coverage a voice actor. I've done some adaptive writing and directing as well. Um, if you guys were here five years ago, we did a web series that we shot quite possibly in this room called Confessionals. So I know I've seen some of you guys that were here. So it's so fun to get to be back. Oh, hello. How are you guys? We're good. Um, as I told you before, I wanted to know what was it like working on the audiobook for Sword Art Online? The best. Uh, so I got contacted to do the second audiobook. Bryce had done the first one and he said, you're going to love working with this team, but they wanted to know if you'd like to be a part of it. And I said, uh, absolutely. Yes, please. I haven't done that many audiobooks. I've worked with the Color World team and done that audiobook. So to get to jump back into Sword Art and to get to relive all of those things from the first couple of seasons that we did, uh, was so, so, so special. And then I got terrified because then I had to do a Kirito impression <laughs> and a Yui impression and Elizabeth impression. And I felt a lot of pressure because these are all my friends and there's no way I can sound like Bryce and there's no way I can sound like Cassandra. So I kind of just did uh, whatever my, my take was. So I hope you guys enjoy us being silly and getting to imitate each other because it was a blast. Your Kirito voice was just hilarious. I've never heard you try to be a male character before. Yeah, I, uh, it was very weird. Um, but somebody said, like, it's very strange. Uh, the, the director who's working on it, she's like, I definitely know that you're used to the way Bryce talks because the way that you breathe and you take breaks is the way Bryce does. And I was like, see, I've heard his voice many times. So that was very fun. I'm glad that you enjoyed them. Thanks for, thanks for checking them out. Hello. Hello again. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. So my question is about your role as Lucy. Yes. Um, how, how did you come about the role? Did you go in to audition for the role or did you go in to audition for another role and then they just like, oh, she's, she's perfect for this role? Um, how did that happen? So uh, the way it used to work at Funimation, um, pre and pre... Um, Simuldubs, you would get a call from Tara, who is the scheduling coordinator, and she would say, we're doing auditions for this new anime, and you would show up, and there would be a binder with all these different characters, and you would get to kind of read through the sides and pick out who you might want to read for, and sometimes they'll say, we want you to pick two or three characters. I usually would pick, like, an adult character and a child character so that they could, I would show a range, and they could cast me however they wanted. Um... Obviously, for fairy tale, I was very familiar with fairy tale, and I was a fan of the show, and I had worked with the director Tyler many times. So I looked at the sides, and I would not audition for Lucy because I loved Lucy as a character, and I thought there was no chance. And I thought if I said those lines and I didn't get cast, it would be more heartbreaking than if I just never auditioned for it. So I auditioned for Urza, and I auditioned for Happy. And I was about to walk out of the booth and uh, Tyler goes, oh, so you're just not going to audition for Lucy? And I said, I, no, I'm not going to do that because I love this show and I love fairy tale and it would mean so much to be a part of fairy tale. And it's going to hurt if I, don't, if I read for this character that I love and I don't get cast. And the first line of the sides was, I love fairy tale so much and I would give anything to be a part of fairy tale. And he goes, okay, how about you just talk then? So I just <laughs> talked about how much I loved fairy tale, and then he was like, how about you just say some of the lines because you're already saying the lines. Uh, so it was a little, bit of, a little bit of both, of me not thinking I had a chance and the director saying, no, I believe in you, and I think you can do this. So that's how that worked out, and I'm very glad it did. Perfect. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of us in here as well as myself well, are, thank you so are very much. glad that that's the way it turned out. So. Yes, and the director also, I don't know if Todd's told this story because I don't know if he's aware, um, I worked on, recorded the first couple episodes. 
and they still hadn't announced who was playing Natsu. And I told the director, who's playing Natsu? All these people are saying, all these male actors are saying they're still auditioning, and they're still doing callbacks. And Todd had been asking me like, can you please check with Tyler and see what's happening with that? And he goes, oh, Natsu's Todd. I'm just gonna make him sweat a little bit. So he was the last to know. Uh, and everybody knew he was already cast except for Todd. That was the trick that they played on him. Yeah. That's that's funny and hopeful, yeah, yes. absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. So thank much. you so much. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've seen a lot of like different animes and shows that you've done. Thank so, you. So, like, out of all the characters that you have voiced, what was your favorite character that you voiced? Ooh, that's so hard. Um, my mom and my husband always get frustrated with me because I will finish a session and say, "I'm playing this character, and this is my favorite character that I've ever gotten to play." And then I will go to my next session, either later that day or the next day, and I will say, no, I mean, this is my favorite character, and this is my favorite session I've gotten to play. So it honestly is the most recent character that I've played. And I will say, oh my gosh, if I got to work on this show, that would be it. I, I, nothing can top this. And then I'll get to work on something else. I'm like, nothing can top this. And my husband is like, you are so fickle that you like change your mind immediately after. But I'm just super excited, and I like as soon as I get to work on something, I can't believe that I'm getting another opportunity. So it's beyond exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. And yourself? I'm doing well. I'm drinking some tea, which is fantastic. I think it's better in the Persona Five mug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just it. feel like that's what it does. It just gets better. <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, the question I have today is that you got to play in some very influential and very impactful shows throughout your career and very strong supporting characters. How does it feel to play characters um, such as, well, even Gillian, you played as Pen Pen even. Yes. I was terrified, terrified to do Pen Pen for the same reason that I was terrified to voice Grookey in Pokemon. I'm terrified to do creatures because they don't say words. And I do not make noises on a regular basis. So uh, I did not know how that was going to work. So Carrie Kiernan, who is the director for Evangelion, um, played some penguin noises on YouTube for me. <laughs> and so we listened to the original Japanese. We listened to some penguin noises and then kind of ad-libbed in between to come up with the pen pen voice, uh, which actually ended up being a lot of fun as soon as I got out of my own head and got out of my own way and allowed myself to play and not feel like I needed to be perfect. Which is the same experience with Grookey, actually. Uh, when I got cast as Grookey in Pokemon, um, during the I was like so stressed during the wanting to make sure I was doing everything right and being safe and still doing great work, even not having the director in person. Um, and the director just said, Grookey doesn't care. Grookey <laughs> just wants to play. And getting to step into a booth and know that the character that you're voicing wants nothing more than to hit people on the head with a stick <laughs> and jump around and give people hugs. And that's all that you're concerned about. Nothing else matters. It was very liberating. So those two characters that ended up being some of the hardest for me in the beginning ended up being the most freeing and the most liberating once I got out of my own way of needing to be perfect, which is nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are um, you? Good, thank you. It's nice to see you again after good meeting to see you, you earlier this week. Um, Absolutely. I just want to say, like, I think you're so talented. Thank uh, you so much. I love seeing you as V in Cyberpunk. And, and I have to say, Gage is, like, my favorite Borderlands character because awesome. her lines are so funny. Yes, she's a blast. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, but mine's a fairy tale question. Okay. Um, so, what was your favorite arc to play as Lucy um, emotionally, and and why? Um, one of my all-time favorites. I know that's not the name of the the name of the arc, but I call it the Michelle Lobster arc. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that whole arc. I also really, really, really love all of the stuff with. Uh, Leo, Loki, and the Celestial Spirit King. I feel like that is one of the first times that we really get to see who Lucy is and how far she's willing to go for her friends and her integrity. And when she says, 
I will do anything for these spirits. They are my friends. They are my family. Like, she means it. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about Lucy. Like, it's not just, it's not just a, uh, it's not just something that she says, and it's not just for show. Like, she, she would die for these people. She loves these people. Um, and so those are, any time that we kind of get to see Lucy so desperate to protect the people she loves, those are my favorite moments. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for all you do. Oh, thank Have you so much. Show. Thanks for watching it. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well. Um, I first want to thank you once again. Uh, Fairy Tale is a show that I watch with my mom and my sisters, and it brings us together. Amazing. Um, and uh, I really appreciate all the effort you put into your characters thank as well. Thank you so Lucy, much. Lucy, Asuna, all of them. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you guys watching it. I would not get to do more seasons or more episodes if you guys did not watch. So thank you so much. Um, I've become interested in voice acting because I was inspired through the fairy tale cast. And so um, as an aspiring voice actor, I'm curious as to how many hours do you actually spend in the recording studio in a given period of uh, a job or whatever? So it, it will vary. Um, I know for the first episode of the first episode of Fairy Tale, I think Lucy had about 24 hours of recording just for that first episode. Um, but then there will be times that I will end up having four hours of recording and we'll go through eight episodes or six episodes. So it just, it just depends. Um, as far as how many hours a day I spend voice acting between the various shows I'm working on, uh, sometimes you'll go weeks at a time and there will be no session and you go, uh, oh no, am I ever gonna work again? And then there are times that you're recording uh, 12 hours a day. Um, for Cyberpunk, um, I was recording sometimes eight hours a day uh, and then in Santa Monica, so I would drive down there, record eight hours, and then there were still a couple shows I had to get done, so I would sometimes start my day at 9 a.m., and I would finish recording at 11 o'clock at night and then drive home and start the day over again. So it is really a feast or famine time um, because then there are other days where you're like, I'm so glad that I saved money because I have not worked in weeks <laughs> and I have to feed my cats food. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky job, but when you're very, very fortunate to work, um, you are so, so grateful for it because you know what it's like to not have a job. And for the same reason, you're so super stoked to see your friends work because you know that they understand how difficult it can be to get a job. So uh, it's really fun to get to see. But thank you so much, and good luck with voice acting. Thank you, and those 11, 12-hour days are why we are here as well, so thank yes, you. Yes, thank you so much. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you again, too. So my question is based off of a panel I saw yesterday with Bryce. Okay. So he talked about how he pulled in, like, personal experiences, like his dog eating chip, his chips for his anger. Is it the same thing for you? Yes, all the time. Never, never my dog eating chips. Um, usually for me, uh, I always say it's amazing the characters that I get cast as when I get to play these characters, what I'm dealing with in my life, um, because I'll, I'll get to say a line or a character will say a line to my character and I'll go, oh my gosh, that was exactly what I needed to hear to get through this personal challenge that I'm dealing with. Um, I've had moments in my life for probably every character that I've played, uh, where, like, a, a moment voicing Lucy where she says to her dad, um, I don't care what you think, I'm, I'm going to join Fairy Tale. This is where I feel like my life is supposed to be. I remember leaving the studio that day, and I had been flying out to L.A. back and forth from Texas, and I was being told by my representation in L.A., like, you've got to make a choice. And also my bank account was letting me know it was getting really expensive, so I was going to have to figure out where I was going to stay. And um, I remember thinking, like, if I was cast as a character who has absolute total faith in herself and her dream, but I'm not willing to take a risk and move out to L.A. for my dream, then I'm a hypocrite. So that was why I ended up moving. Um, when I worked on Asuna, the Mother's Azario arc, obviously it deals with loss, and I was dealing with the loss of a family member. 
uh, while we were recording that, and I did the whole scene to my loved one that had passed away. Um, and it was instrumental to my uh, grief process. Um, there are so many times in cyberpunk where the lines that I said or the things that I said, I'm like, this is exactly what I needed to say to myself, to other people in my life to get through this. So it's amazing. It's like these characters are my guardian angels that like when I need them, they show up and they give me the wisdom that I need through some brilliant writer who is writing these great scripts or this brilliant director who's giving me direction and I'm just along for the ride. So uh, yeah, I, my personal experience is in probably every single character that I've played in one way or another. Maybe one day it will be because my, my cats ate my food and I'll be super frustrated, but that has not happened as of yet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, um, so first off, uh, Shermie, I, I really like your work. Thank and you. I, I, liked, I like Persona 5, Fairy Tale, Dorhi Doro. Yes. Uh, no, he's great. Yes, uh, and, she's so fun. And most importantly, and the re and one of my questions is based off Violet Evergarden. Yes. Uh, the second question is uh, for my uh, one of my greatest friends, uh, Zappy. Sure. Uh, she's also a big Violet Evergarden fan. Amazing. Uh, she basically forced me to watch it. Uh, so for Violet Evergarden, uh, how did you feel like going through like each episode and like being like? How did you feel about like the show as a whole? So when I first got uh, brought in um, with Bob and Megan and the team at SDI, they said we're working on the show called Violet Evergarnet and we'd like you to play this character, Iris. I loved her character design and I was like, I have never been like, I need to cosplay a character. I just love her entire outfit. Um, since then, I've been like, oh, I could wear a couple of cosplays, that'd be fun. But that character, I was like, man, she is so cool and she's so unique. Um, first of all, that show in general is beautiful, that show is but amazing. they just really love to rip my heart out <laughs> consistently. It's so hurtful. Three, epi three, three words, the soldier episode. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now it becomes a point anytime they say like, we're working on Violet Evergarden. Uh, I don't know if it's just Iris or every character in the show. I know it happens with Violet. But, like, I don't think Iris ever gets, like, a nice scene. It's always, like, Iris is being slighted. Iris has to, like, right. d give some tragic news. Um, so I know any time I'm scheduled for Violet Evergarden, it's going to be a day where I cry. <laughs> in character and out of character. Yeah. Um, but that movie... Oh, uh, the movie destroyed me. Mm. Destroyed me. Violet did get her happy ending, so I'm happy. True, for her. absolutely, absolutely. Um, but for my next, for Zappy's sure. question, uh, she asked, uh, "What are some of the most? What are some of the characters that you're most proud of? Most proud of voicing?" <sighs> That's so hard. Um, the first one that comes to mind uh, is. Uh, female V in Cyberpunk 2077, just because it was so, it was an immense amount of work over two years. Um, and the entire time, the director knows, everybody knows, uh, the entire time I thought it was only a matter of time before I got fired. So I'm super proud that when the game came out, it was still me. That was a shock. Um, but yeah, it was, I'm really proud of a lot of the work in that it was really challenging. There were a lot of timing issues and having to match the male V's performance exactly. Um, there were some great moments of integration with Keanu Reeves' character, Johnny. Um, so there were a lot of challenging moments with that and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of Asuna, I'm really proud of Lucy. Um, I'm really proud of Gruki because I was terrified to do it um, and it was really, really fun. Um, Ah, I had a I had a, a moment in um, uh, actually a couple months after everything shut down um, that I got to work on in the the new Adams Family movie, um, and I got to play a character named Ophelia who was a pig, um, and I'm super proud that I I got to be a part of that film, and I got to play a character that was totally out of my comfort zone. And I got to record it at home, and then it was in a theater, and that was really incredible. 
Um, but it's impossible to pick just like one or two because I know at the end of the day, I will leave work and go, I'm so proud of like this moment or this scene or this line. Obviously the characters that I've played over a longer span, I feel like I've gotten to grow with them. And so there's, there's more of those moments. So it's easier to say I'm, I have more, uh, more of a catalog to choose from of work that I'm proud of whether, than if it was just like one line here or two lines here. Um, but yeah, most of the time the stuff that I'm super proud of is the stuff that I thought, there's no way you're gonna be able to do this and then it's done. And I have no idea who jumped in and helped me do it, but we got it done and it, was, uh, it all worked out. That's great, and uh, continue the good work. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, hi Sharmi, how Hello. are you? I saw you on Friday, I don't know if you recognize me, I yes. had hair then. <laughs> absolutely, good to see you. Uh, so my question for you is, as your role as Rhea in Fire Emblem, yes. um, big Fire Emblem fan, Thank you, uh, so much. you had to I like Ray. she's a great complex character. You had to do a lot of different emotions with that character. Joy, yes. peace, anger, regret. What was the toughest part about recording for Rhea and how'd you get through it? Um, so without spoiling what this means, I'm just gonna say dragon. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, oh, yep, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> that was horrifying. Mm. Um, and Patrick Seitz is, was uh, was my director and was is just one of the greatest creature artists ever um so having to be like will you please help me through this and i said multiple times are you guys gonna fix this because uh uh i i am a tiny person <laughs> a dragon would eat me um so dragon was the most terrifying is the most terrifying um and then just, there were a couple times where they would tell me like, you don't have to try as hard. Rhea just is. And I was like, but Rhea is like, like a Dumbledore sort of a presence, like magical and just exudes this presence. I feel like I need to Yeah, she do has a lot something. going on. And they were like, no, you just need to be present and just know that you are confident and that you are enough. And I was like, oh God, that hit me in an emotional place. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'm super insecure. So Rhea is so nice to just go in and be like, Rhea doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. Rhea knows Rhea is epic and awesome. <laughs> and to kind of get to step into those shoes and that uh, beautiful headdress um, is very empowering, which is very cool. And also challenging at times. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. You look awesome. Thank you. Whoa, so anytime you talk, it lights up. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. I got it from a booth here. I need to go see if I can find mm -hmm. one of those, but I, I don't know if I'll be able to make it before I go to the airport. But if I wore that to the airport, <laughs> I might have a lot of friends or no friends at all. Both are great? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if TSA would be concerned about me, but it's really cool. I love it so much. Thank you. Um, so my question is, out of like all, all the shows or characters that you played and did, was there ever a moment or a scene or phrase that just was so emotional to you, like devastating or? Um, yeah, there's there's been a couple, and I wish I could remember exactly, um, exactly what the line was. But there's there's been a couple. I mean, you guys know sometimes you'll just be watching a movie and a scene will hit you differently and you've seen it a hundred times, but you're like, oh my gosh, I can't get through the scene without crying. Um, usually when I'm working, I'm fine and I can like focus and get the line out. But there's been multiple times that I'll come home at the end of the day and I have to like decompress or I'm telling my mom or my husband like some of the scenes that I did. Um, and there were a couple days um it's definitely happened with um uh, with Susa Ha and Steinsgate definitely happened with um V and Cyberpunk certainly with Asuna um and definitely with with Iris and actually also with Chloe from Pokemon Journeys but I'll be like talking about the day and I just like can't can't explain what these characters went through without crying and um it I, I don't know why, like uh, it's, it just like, 
when I'm in the scene, it's different, but when I'm talking about them and it's me talking about these characters, the empathy that I have for them is just so overwhelming that I, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is still really real. I, I have to let this go. And so usually what I've been doing, um, certainly in the last two years, I have a journal. And after every single session that I have, every single character that I play, I try to write at least a couple of lines of like who I voiced, who I played. Sometimes that happens for auditions as well if I was just really emotionally hit by the character. And I'll just journal like a favorite line that I had that day or a moment that really hit me so that I can journal it out so it's not sitting in me and I'm not carrying it with me always. Because um, sometimes it could just be impossible yeah. to let it go. And it's great because like at the end of the year, uh, I have this journal and I get to look back and see all these amazing moments that I had so it kind of becomes like a little scrapbook, which has been awesome. Well, thank you, that's thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your work. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for watching and listening to everything. Hi. Hello, Hello again. Hello again. Um, so this is another fairy tale question and you, you partially answered, the, answered it with my first question. Okay. Uh, but do you remember an early episode um, where all of you switched bodies? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, how much fun did you have with that? And if you could have switched with someone else, who would it have been? Ooh. Okay. So if I could have switched with anybody else, it would have been Panther Lily because I love Panther Lily so much. Um, Plue would have also been really fun because you just like shake. Um, I love getting to do any sort of body swap episodes, but immediately when I'll be working on something and the director will say, so we're switching bodies. I'm like, oh no, there's no way I'm gonna be able to get this exactly right. Um, and it's never about getting it exactly right. It's just about like having fun and trying to embody as best you can. Right. Um, so yeah, it was, it was terrifying, but it was a blast. And we got to do something similar with uh, Tales of Luminaria uh, recently, and it was a blast. So anytime we get to switch bodies, it's super fun. Excellent, excellent. I like to hear what they, their impressions of me as well. That's very fun. <laughs> no, that was one of my favorite, like, early on episodes. Oh, it's a blast. Like, I guess you could say a filler episode, but it's like one of my favorite ones. Yes. You know, so. Oh, it's so much fun. We loved working on it. Right. We could not stop laughing. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm asking a curious question because I recently got my first gig as a uh, audio drama voice actor. Amazing. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and I'm curious, based on your experience, what do you think are the unique challenges between doing a voice acting job for a original project that was like written in your native language, I'm sorry, English, or versus uh, voice acting in a, for a project that was originally voice acted in Japan or sure. somewhere else. Like what do you think are the unique challenges between those? So um, what's always uh, challenging for me for an original project, usually um, if it's original animation in English, they haven't, they haven't drawn anything or there's no art for us to look at except maybe some, some character specs and they're sometimes gonna film us and animate to our face and our reactions. So there's a lot more freedom in that way, but there's also a lot less guidance of like, well, what does the world look like? What does the music sound like? What, can we be informed in these ways? And oftentimes, They'll have some ideas, but they haven't nailed anything down. So it's hard to make sure that everything is matching and the tone is fitting. Um, it's kind of like doing black box theater or acting in front of a green screen. You're like, I hope this is what you guys want because I have no idea what the, what the world is going to look like around me. Um, whereas with animation um, that's been done in Japan, anime or um, even live action dubs, and we're going to be putting it into uh, an English language option. Um, the trick there is that the animation is already preset, predetermined. We've got to match the flaps for live action. Um, it, you could tell that they're saying like a B sound or an L sound or an M, and you've got to figure out how to make the translation stay the same while also trying to hit all these different letters. So it is 
how many different ways can we say the same thing but also make it fit these flaps and also not lose any of the emotion or the intention that um, the actors gave us in the other language. So that can be very challenging, but also for me it's very invigorating because it's the whole team working together of going, wait, we could put the M at the end, we could do that, it could be me instead of, which is always really exciting to get to work on that and it feels like a very teamwork environment thing. Um, but also uh, for original animation, sometimes we get to record together. So we get teamwork in a different way. We get to play off of each other and do some improv. And uh, sometimes the writer will say, oh, based on what you just did, I had another idea for a line. Could you add this or could you give us another alt? So it's just kind of figuring out how the collaborative process is going to adapt based on do we have the image? Do we not have the image? Are, what, are, what are our constraints? What are we bound by? Um, and the only thing that is, the, that is at the core with both is remaining flexible and remaining open and being ready to play. That is the only thing that uh, you have in common for both of them because the constraints will be different. Cool, thank you. Absolutely. Howdy. Oh, no. oh that was loud. Uh, just had a really quick question. How do you um, prepare or approach specific roles in which I guess you would have to, or I guess where there ha had been a previous actor, specifically I'm thinking things like Sailor V, sure. uh, Shauna, Shaka no Shauna, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes it depends based on, um, based on the knowledge that we have. Um, sometimes the, the production team um, will contact us and say, we want as close of a vocal match as possible. Sometimes they'll say, we want this to take on an energy of its own. For me, it's always so much pressure because the actors that have come before have done such an incredible job and the last thing that you want to do is try to copy them because I'm not them and I can't be exactly like them. It's just going to seem like a second-rate version of this actor. Um, but I, if I'm given the materials and I'm given the opportunity, like with Shauna, um, they allowed me to have access to Tabitha's performance. So before every session, I would listen to a little bit of Tabitha. I would obviously listen to the Japanese and then whatever those two voices inspired in me is how we came up with Shauna. Um, with Sailor V, uh, I was terrified. Um, I auditioned for all of them. I had callbacks for Sailor Moon and Luna. Um, and I was told by the production team that they sent all of our auditions to the production team in Japan to figure out what everybody liked. And they heard my slate of me just saying my name and they were like, that's Sailor Venus. So they said, we kind of just want your voice and who you are, um, which was not the direction that I had thought. So you kind of just throw things at the wall. It's like making spaghetti. You throw it at the wall, you see what sticks. And then as you're in the booth, they say, a little bit lower, a little bit higher. We're going to make our own path here. Um, or uh, this is a phrase that everybody really, really loves, so we want to stay true to this. It just totally depends on what the, the director wants and what the producer wants. Um, but for me, I, I'm always terrified anytime I'm taking on a role that someone else has done because I know they love the role and I know that, that audiences have loved them in that role and it's a lot of pressure and it's not something that I ever take lightly. So I always want to make sure to honor them um, and also... Uh, bring my own spin to it, because that's why they gave me the opportunity to play the character. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello. hello again. Hello again. Um, this one is kind of double dipping with an earlier question. Okay. But I was curious, what is the biggest difference between voice acting for like an anime versus a video game? Is there a big difference in the recording process? So um, it's, uh, it varies based on if it's... Um, I guess in, sometimes with the RPGs, they will have pre-existing video files that we can match to, which is going to feel very similar to an anime because we have to match the existing flaps. Mm -hmm. But then also it's going to feel like an original animation project because some of the stuff, we just don't have to worry about that. 
Um, if they are having another actor sort of like share the role as they did with cyberpunk or um, another actor in another language share the role, we have timing constraints. And it's just a matter of sometimes they'll say, we have 0.3 frames to play with. It has to be within a second of each line. So sometimes they want an exact, exact match. Sometimes they say, if it's plus or minus a second, that's fine, but it has to fit on that card when the dialogue is there. So again, it just varies on what their, what their needs are. Do we have animation already existing? When I've done motion capture projects, it's felt a little bit more um, open world. Uh, we're walking around with PVC pipes, but they'll say like, this has already been predetermined as this is the rock you guys are sitting on and they'll tape it off and say, the blocking has to happen here, this has to happen here. So the, the, the specifications and the things that we have to be concerned with, the blocking we have to hit, the marks that we have to hit uh, can be a little bit different. Sometimes when we're wearing the dots on our face, they'll say, could you add a little bit more eyebrow movement? Could you make your eyes a little bit more alive? Because it's really hard for us to animate. I've worked on a video game recently where the, they had a bunch of actors doing the motion capture, they had another actor doing the voice, and then I went in just to provide the facial expressions. So I had to match this actor's vo uh, vocal timing for the voice, and I had to match these different actors' physical. So I had to make sure that I was kind of checking back within each screen and keeping the, the audio in my ears as a perfect match because my lips needed to match what she was doing, um, which was a weird way of doing things. So it just kind of depends on what they, what they need. Um, that's one of my favorite things about the job. Anytime somebody says, we're doing things a little bit different, I get very excited because I'm like, give me another challenge. I'm excited. Teach me another way. Um, to fix whatever is the impossible challenge that you guys are trying to figure out for this game. Okay, awesome. And it sounds like you rise up every time, so yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but I certainly do learn <laughs> each time, so that's the best part. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good. I just wanted to start by saying that I'm a very big fan. Thank you so much. You're one of those actors that um, I will just look up works that you're in to Aww, play them. Thank you, that means a lot. <laughs> but... Um, a lot of people have had questions about characters, so I was trying to come up with something a little bit unique, and I was wondering if you had a character that you particularly, particularly remember having a lot of fun with, because one of the things I like is how you seem like you have a lot of fun with characters like May from yes. Fire Emblem or Iris Heart from the Neptune series. Yes, absolutely. Um, the bubbly ones, like you said, May, those are always a lot of fun to do. Um, I had a lot of fun... Um, working on Rainbow High. I play two characters in Rainbow High for the opposite reason. The bubbly ones are always super fun because they're very upbeat and crack a lot of jokes and are very funny. But when I got cast in Rainbow High, I get to play two very dark, icy kind of girls yeah. that have a very dark sense of humor. Um, and man, it's really fun to get to be just so mean or dripping with animosity uh, and, and knowing like, this is a very bright, colorful show and I am <laughs> a terrible person. Um, so those were very, very fun to play. And then you get to walk into a store and see that these dolls are sitting on the shelves and uh, it's just a weird, a weird experience, but it's really, really fun. Yeah, I get to hear it, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, my uncle is a big fan of you and your work. Sweet. So I was Thank just like, you. maybe I should just meet her. Amazing. <laughs> well, it's lovely to meet you. Tell your uncle I said hi. Yeah, I will. Um, so my question for you is, are there any roles you've done or things you've done in your career that you feel that not many people know about and maybe you want them to know about more? Ooh. Yes, there are. And I always, whenever I come to this moment, I would like, I'm like, nobody is gonna know about this show. I should make a mental note. And there's a long list. And then when the time comes, I forget the list. <laughs> um, I have done a lot of on-camera work since I was a kid, a lot, 
very few people know about like the on-camera stuff that I've done. Um, so that's very fun. Uh, as far well, not a lot of people know about uh, uh, Last uh, Last Hope that I did, which was a show that I directed on Netflix, co-directed on Netflix, which was very very fun. Um, and my husband also uh, wrote one of the episodes for the show, which was very cool. Um, I not a lot of people know about. Uh, I got to work on the new Ghost in the Shell adaptation that came out on Netflix in 2020. Uh, it's really, there's a lot of things that came out in 2020 that I'm like, man, I would really love to talk to people about this. Um, so that was one. I love that character. And I got to be directed by Mary Elizabeth McGlenn herself, which was the coolest. That was actually the last session that I got to do. Um, uh, I did that session, and then I did a striker session, and then that's when everything shut down and we were in lockdown. Um, so that was really, really special to get to, to work with the, the commander, um, which is incredible. Um, I also love getting to work on BNA, uh, and I haven't gotten to talk to anybody about that because that released in 2020. Um, so yeah. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of really fun shows. And then, of course, shows that I did like years and years ago. I worked on Ghost Hunt, which was so much fun. Sergeant Frog I worked on. Um, and when I say, if you guys didn't watch the shows, we wouldn't get to do them. Yeah. Sergeant Frog is a perfect example because uh, people said, we love to watch the show as a family and as friends, and it's like a party anime for us. But because people weren't buying as many discs because they were sharing them with friends and family. They said, I guess people don't like it. And that's why they stopped dubbing it. So it, when we say it means the world that you guys watch, that's the only reason we get to do it. It is the only reason we get to do it. So when you guys wait in line and you have me sign your discs and I get to talk about these shows, it really is the coolest thing. Because when I record, I'm alone. I don't get to talk to anybody about it. Um, so it really is super, super special. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, personally, real quick, my favorite role that you've done is A2 from Neo Automata. Oh, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Yeah, all right, thank you. She breaks my heart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what involved you to become a voice actor? What inspired me to become a voice actor? You're holding it right there. Oh, um, all right. Barney is actually what inspired me to want to be an actor when I was a child. Um, my mom is a dance teacher, and... Um, she had a student that was on Barney, and that's the only thing that my brain could understand being an actor was. And I was like, I want to go play make-believe all day and be on a show. So I told my mom I wanted to take acting classes so that I could be on Barney. And my mom took me to open calls, which you will show up and you'll wait in line for hours and hours and hours to say two lines, and they'll send you on your way. And I thought those were the best days ever. So that backfired on her. Um, and then she put me in acting classes with kids that were much older than me. So it would be like so hard that I would be over it. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And she told the acting teacher on the first day, I'm going to be here at noon. Just please discourage her. This is a very hard business. My daughter is very sensitive. And I do not want her to get her heart crushed. And the acting teacher was like, I got it. So my mom comes back at noon and the acting teacher was like, she's actually having a really great time and we love having her here, so you can go. Um, so that backfired on my mom as well. Um, I never got to be on Barney, but I did have an agent who introduced me to the world of voiceover and I started working for Radio Disney and doing voiceover commercials and things like that. So it's amazing that what started as a dream to hang out and work with a purple dinosaur ended up taking me on a on a totally different path um if they ever got to bring back barney though i would do anything to be like a teacher to be a director to be an extra just so that i could finally say i got to work on the show okay thank you thank you so much Hi, i'm jack and i'm a fan of your voice playing makoto nijima thank you Persona so 5. much good to see you again jack <laughs> oh thanks and I was wondering, what are some roles that you really wanted to play but didn't get the chance to? And like, how did that make you feel? Oh, I've auditioned for hundreds and hundreds of things on camera and otherwise that I did not get. 
Uh, it breaks my heart every single time. It doesn't get easy. But then when I see the final product and I see who got cast and I see the entire team that got to do it, I'm like, I didn't fit and that's okay. Uh, but yeah, it's hard when you don't get to work on something you'd love to do. But then I get to work on all these other great projects. So sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, and that's okay. Are there any uh, like specific ones that you might think um, of? Y- yeah, there's, there's quite a few. I mean, when I was 10, I auditioned for Hermione Granger and Harry Potter, and I didn't get to work on that. Oh, but yeah. that's okay, because Emma Watson is incredible and was the absolute best choice. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, I just want to say real quick, I absolutely loved you in uh, Cyberpunk. As, oh, thank uh, as you. B. Thank you, thank you. Um, and if you could uh, say anything uh, about working on that project that you enjoyed. Oh, everything. Uh, I love the creative team. I love the director that I worked with. Um, the only thing I wish, and it would be like my dream come true, is to get to do a panel with the cast and the crew, because I have never gotten to see them in person. So... Um, they're incredibly talented people, and if I could just like give them all a hug, it would be the coolest thing ever. So hopefully one day that will come, and we'll get to do a panel together, because I have so much love in my heart for that entire team. They're so, so wonderful, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming. I am so sad that it's the end of the weekend, but it's been such a gift, and this is my first show back after, as someone said yesterday, the incident. Um, So thank you, thank you, thank you guys so much for taking the time and doing everything to keep everybody safe and keep yourself safe, and I hope to see you guys very, very soon. Thank you, thank you.